Jaden, thank you everyone for coming. It's a pretty good showing, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Craig Spake. I work at the web engineering team at RT. Uh, my name is Brennan. I direct the web engineering team at RT. And uh, we're going to talk about how recently we switched over all of our desktop web and mobile website traffic to Node from the Rails model to Rails project. And this Node, these Node projects are you're ready for the buzzword isomorphic, which just means sharing JavaScript code server and client. So we'll dive into how that's done and uh, hopefully you find a lot of interesting. Um, so, so we'll start with uh, why we transitioned to Node, um, how we did that, what our stack looks like now. I'll dive into um, a project we extracted called Easel, which is an isomorphic boilerplate that we use to bootstrap our projects at RC. And then we'll wrap up with some wins and pain points uh, from the position. You know. So let's we'll start with why uh, we chose Node. Um, and to get into that, sort of have to dive into a brief history of RSC's tech stack. So if you look at the diagram here, we started off pretty uh, typical monolithic Rails project, and that was wildly productive for us at first and working out really well. But soon we at that time, we had a designer, so we hired a designer, and we started to get a more fancy front end, uh, lots of more client side JavaScript, so we adopted Backbone around like 03, um, pretty early on. And at the same time, we were building an iOS prototype, uh, and we needed to build out an API to support that prototype. So, fast forward, and that Backbone UI is growing, and our front end is becoming a pretty monolithic single page background application. Our API is also growing, but this entire Mom Rails project is just taking on a ton of different responsibilities, and things are starting to get a little messy. So this was started to become unfun to work in. Uh, some of the pain points of working in this monolithic Rails stack were with a giant single page um, application. Our testing was pretty much all integration testing using Capybara which is a Selenium driver for Ruby, and Selenium fires up Firefox, the web browser, and literally clicks around, and it's really slow and very brittle. So we had test leads that took like two hours, paralyzed on eight machines, and that just kept growing hours long. It was like such a pain in the ass to work in. That was one of the big pain points of this stack. So we knew we had to fix this JavaScript testing. Um, also, some of the things you might hear from isomorphic land, there's lack of reuse across the server and client. We had to start to uh, have faster page loads. We needed to optimize the server-side rendering, but of course that means we're duplicating Ruby libraries, like date formatting, or price libraries, um, our templating libraries, even though we have AML on the client, AML on the, the server, it was AMLJS and AML Ruby, and you couldn't really reuse them. Uh, just the fact that it was a large hybrid stack was a lot to boot up, not only seeing the data days, including the Rails project, we also have to install Node to get, because we used certain preprocessors, you have to make sure that those libraries were installed to um, preprocessors, and it's just really hard for new developers to uh, get started on this project. And again, with a single page application, a large single page application, we our initial page load was suffering greatly. We had large assets like megabyte JavaScript and megabyte CSS files. This monolithic thing had to be broken up, not only because it was unproductive, but it was affecting our users because our page load was so slow. So knowing that we had to break this up, uh, how did we start to introduce Node into a stack? Um, this started before we got into where we are now. We had a chance, the opportunity to build an entirely separate project outside of Node. We had a new application entirely. And we knew that we wanted to test this idea of having an external client app that was consuming our API. And this was our CMS, an application we get our content partners to manage their inventory on Etsy. And so this, we tried to solve the main pain point, which was testing JavaScript. And what we did was we used, we tested our client side. This was still a single page background but we had done a pretty good job solving the problem of JavaScript testing by running our client-side tests using Node. 
um, and create using things like JS DOM to create an environment where we can run our tests headless and really fast and actually like see what we do in testing our JavaScript modules. So that was great and uh, uh, solved that testing issue for us. But eventually we knew, we knew that we couldn't maintain this giant Rails app for our, our main front as well. So we started to uh, find a, a low hanging fruit to start to introduce Node into our main front end stacks. And this was, again, having a giant single page application and trying to responsibly handle that was not working out in most cases. Um, I'm sure other people have probably have strong opinions on this as well. But yeah, so uh, again, megabyte assets and JavaScript and CSS not going to work on mobile. Uh, also, simply just having very intense UI that's catered towards a desktop screen and then trying to turn that into something that's significantly different and fast enough for mobile clients. This was almost out of the question with their current stack. So, we introduced, we started to think of how we could solve the rest of our problems um, using Node. And so, some of these again were lack of reuse. Uh, with the server and client, so we started to think about is it possible to share rendering server client and having a large monolithic assets, is there ways we can break up a giant website into smaller pieces that we can have smaller asset packages, packages catered towards this front end experience. Um, and so this was a project that I was mostly myself but other devs contributed, contributed to and we pretty much rewrote all of our uh, mobile UI in four months, so that was a success for productivity, better test coverage, faster page loads, etc. So after that, we finally took the learnings from that project and applied it to our desktop website. And again, in four months, with four devs this time, we were able to completely migrate all of our uh, root, our Rails front end onto this node app. Um, so now Brian's going to talk a little bit about how we were actually able to transition this without killing the business and future freezing and whatnot. Yeah. Um, hey. So it's important to remember that like yeah, rewrites do co companies. Like we're a startup and we're still trying to figure out our sort of product market fit and like halting feature development for some like engineering wins, quote unquote, like being more productive. Um, can kill your company and that like other businesses can like sort of jump you on features and sort of beat you in, in the end. Um, so what we did was try to, we had to end up doing a feature freeze, but we um, restructured the team so that we were still able to respond to our various like, business needs. And so what we did is have like one sort of engineering manager like man just dealing with like inbound bugs and requests and making sure that like nothing sort of fell apart on a basically user-facing experience while everyone else um, basically transitioned to the site page by page. So um, for example, like how we actually did this, we would say have uh, like the artist page. Uh, and what we would do is build this page out exactly as it existed in our sort of monolithic Rails stack, put in the node stack, add tests, um, have it up at some like our Heroku app. So it would be like you know, artsynode.roquet.com slash artist.id, right? And so people could test it out, we validate it, um, and then we go in and actually add this pretty cool little um, redirect. It's not HFProxy, but Nginx. Um, and we um, would have basically an Nginx redirect that would say, all right, all incoming requests to artsy.net that start with slash artist slash star um, go to this new node app. And they would start serving traffic to it, and they would take only direct hits. So our, since our old app was a, a backbone app, um, it would sort of navigate and still had our old um, JavaScript running it. Um, and then after we validated that the sort of node app would take our production traffic, then we would go in and add redirects from our like old backbone app to this <laughs> to the node app, so it would do a full page reload. It's a little bit tedious to go to do this, but it allowed us to transition our, our whole site page by page in a way that was safe. Um, and then once we transitioned this, and that was safe in that like, if the node app went down, we could just remove the HA proxy in the next redirect and like, we'd be fine, right? And be like, oh yeah, like the site didn't actually go down. It always had power. Um, and that, it never happened, like node was great. <laughs> and so, but it was nice to have that backup. 
Um, and then eventually, <laughs> after transitioning page by page, um, we had a few pages that we didn't want to transition. Um, so we, we actually used node HTTP proxy to proxy um, to the old app <laughs> after, after sort of putting this new node app in front of RT.net. Um, that allowed us to like, we have some like admin functionality that it's just like hairy stuff that we don't really, we want to actually replace rather than duplicate. Um, and so it, it's like productivity wise makes sense to just use the node HTTP proxy. So I don't yeah, know. Actually, as, <laughs> as a note, it was, we're still holding on to this one feature that's waiting on design. That's like the one with route which is slash post. So we're redesigning our posting UI and it's like so productive to know that for the first time in our lives we're actually waiting on designers to build features. Yeah. So that's yeah. basically the reason for that. Yeah. Sure. It's a good problem to yeah. have. Um, <laughs> like we're not the bottom there. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about like this node, this mysterious node stack that we use. Uh, so we use pretty standard tools, uh, backbone, browser by Express, uh, we host on Roku. We use um, basically a mere two uh, Roku servers, um, two of the large Roku instances, and um, all of our assets are pushed to S3 and then fronted by CloudFront. Um, and then we do caching and Redis. Um, so this is actually like an interesting sort of exploration for us. Um, we found that uh, having a node app that basically has to place a bunch of API requests to our existing app before rendering a page is you know, it could be faster. It's basically a uh, bottleneck by our API, which has like, say, a 100 to 300 millisecond response time. And so if you place a bunch of consecutive requests, like, you end up with a really long page length. Um, that's bad. So we looked at like a lot of different solutions for caching. Um, the sort of wattest caching strategy you can do is, is just putting the whole site, put a, putting a CDN in front of the whole site. Right, so like, every time you hit a route, we add, like cache headers make it put in CloudFront, and like you're you're not even hitting our servers, you're just hitting CloudFront for this sort of say artist ID route to any world. Um, we found that to be very problematic, and that um, say whenever we deploy new assets, the asset path changes. Uh, you know, the CDN expires say maximum, or the fastest it could expire is probably like every 12 hours. So you have people like getting 12 hour old assets for a while, and if we had a bug that we had mistakenly pushed to production, like we couldn't get rid of it for 12 hours. That would be really bad. Um, and so we pretty much uh, mixed that, and uh, then looked at sort of full page caching. So the idea is that we would, we would use Redis, um, but whenever we render the, the sort of artist page, we would render the whole thing and then stick it in Redis. Um, and then the next time someone wanted to review that page, they would just check, you know, get the version of Red. And we found that to be kind of difficult because we have different content for login and logout users, and then we have like different roles and like we could solve it. Definitely a problem, we could do, but it seemed like a lot of work. Um, and so we ended up settling on this kind of funny little thing, which was just overriding back on the same. Um, so that it would always, if you pass a sort of parameter, like in our case, just cache true, it would check Redis, um, if it's not there, go to the API and then put it in Redis. And then use the use the full URL with all the query params as the Redis key, and then the JSON that our API responded with as the content. Um, and then our API is sort of a, we use like a standard 12 hour expiration for that, and it, it works pretty well. And it's sped up our page load time, and now our, I think our average node page load is around like, I don't know, 60 to 70 milliseconds. Like those, those uh, Redis calls are like around 10 milliseconds. And so that's, that's great. That was like, we were like, oh, okay, like problem solved. Like that was, it's like 12 lines of code. It's not, it's called, um, what was it, uh, Red Hat? Yeah, Backup Cache. Yeah, Backup Cache. So yeah, see, that's it. And Craig is gonna talk about <coughs> which is the framework that we use, or boilerplate that we use to, <laughs> to build these new applications. Yeah, so we, uh, as Brennan mentioned, we open source the cache library as well as the server side background sync adapter. And this sort of led up to a lot of different small open source projects that culminated into this Easel boilerplate. Um, so, what is Easel? Uh, basically, it's the boilerplate we use to bootstrap new node projects. 
uh, specifically API consuming mining you node know, projects. It has three uh, points to its philosophy, which are modularity, flexibility, and uh, isomorphic or run with JavaScript on both the server and client and share as much as the same we can. Um, so that's a dive in a little bit. How it does modularity is it breaks your project into apps, components, and project level libraries. So apps are sub express applications mounted into your main project. Um, the components are basically modules of reusable UI that groups your JavaScript, CSS, and related uh, assets or templates and tests. So it keeps them nicely self contained which is a very simple pattern that I've seen other, I've researched other node projects and it's like a, something I'd see common to know if it's even like a component.js project that uh, is a like, node module that wraps this philosophy up. So it's, thank you node community for promoting this. It was a big win even though it's a simple pattern to drop. Um, and so I think Probably right now would be a good time to just dive into Easel. I'll start to try to bootstrap the project and show you going from zero to Easel project and what it's like to see a RTS main desktop website and how big that is. But before I dive into that, does anyone have any questions about what's gone over so far? Uh, yeah, I have a few questions. <laughs> Um, 
Meteor and Derby are very full stack. If you take control of your database, it's very hard to integrate with an existing API and existing data layer. <clears throat> and also, those are both very real-time heavy projects. For our case, we weren't doing a lot of real-time stuff. We simply needed to optimize a couple of pain points, mainly being optimizing initial page load. Um, we didn't need a whole app to be single page. It didn't need to be updated to the client project. So we didn't need to do a lot of the fancier real-time stuff. Also, we went out render, um, which is very similar. It uses Java and server client, the Linux server client. At the time, render was uh, still even a self-proclaimed prototype, although it sounds like at you know, go, go five now, and Spike Brent was a genius, a very awesome dude. So like love render, but also for our case, it was we want to stay on this bit more modular. Render is kind of like render the entire page from the server, build a sort of uh, framework that then passes off the entire app to the client side of that application. For our needs, for instance, we might have a static about page that's just a simple, just needs to be all rendered on the server or something else that's very client side heavy. We didn't want a project that would prescribe something to the way that rendered it. Although it was also a very interesting project and it does more on the isomorphic end of things like it shares routing, whereas this uh, architecture doesn't try to tell you how to share routing. It just gives you the minimal layer that's necessary to be able to render on the server and make it easy for you to do that. Um, okay, I think I'll take one more before I dive in. Um, did your switch to Node help you deal with the size of a single page app and the problem with a single page app, or did you retain the same backbone data set and just change the underlying Node app? Um, so Node helped in the fact that we could do more on the server and not have to rely on everything being pushed to the client. One of the bigger wins is just the heavy mo uh, modular philosophy of being able to break up your application into smaller pieces that can use smaller assets, which I'll show you in a second how we do that. Okay, one more. Uh, sorry. So, we're also on the path of uh, migrating uh, a monolithic application to uh, sort of a, mic a micro services uh, platform. And uh, I was wondering how, uh, in the process of proxy, uh, old uh, routes and old pages, uh, if you had to deal with uh, synchronizing sessions, mm -hmm. and whether synchronizing sessions mm -hmm. between yeah. the legacy app and the new app, and how you dealt about that, like how you yes. dealt with expiry, uh, expiration and, and refreshing the sessions. Yes, yeah, so that was definitely a big pain point. And mm -hmm. we'll definitely cover that towards the end, but I don't know if Brandon, you want to yeah, I guess we do. Super quick. Um, so interestingly, like, there, it's a bigger problem than we had anticipated, and that we have a, an HTTP and HTTPS version, which um, don't share cookies in some cases. Rails does a lot with it, so you can in theory be logged in sort of in like four different ways, right? Like the HTTP versus the HTTPS version of an app, and the HTTP and the HTTPS version of a Rails app. Right? That's bad. Um, so we took this opportunity to switch to HTTP. HTTPS only, um, and that simplified it a lot. Uh, but in general, we had, um, in both applications, uh, on the client, we placed like, an API request to say, like, just am I a check? Am I actually still authenticated? If not, log me out and redirect me to the same page that I'm on, sort of transparently. So that's, that's one way. And then whenever you log in from the Node app, it would always also log you into the uh, existing Rails app. Uh, like it would place. It would sort of log you in twice. Twice. Yeah. yeah. And that was a way that we synchronized it. And if you logged out from one, it would log you out from the other as well. So we did have to like change the behaviors. And uh, synchronizing the sessions. So let's say you spend 20 minutes on the new section, which yeah. is no power. The other, the other one is actually being expired. It's getting expired. Right. So it's in that not case, the session. So right. Is you might run in, uh, into a, a chance that. Then the other session expires while you're still navigating this session as a logged in user. Yeah. So I mean in the case we just check, we just place a request to like the sort of, you know, I'm a user, get my data route and see if that fails. Like and we do that on each new page load. Yeah. Um, it's, and it will fail. And then that was what we did while we were doing the transition. Yeah. Now it's like no big deal. Yeah, it was it was an interesting thing, but that that helped. I think the off was definitely a big point for us in synchronizing off, especially during the transition. 
Okay, so let's dive into um, actually easel itself and sort of show you how this whole thing works. So I'll go ahead and uh, pull up the terminal here. So to get running on easel yourself, you would simply do npm install easel globally. Uh, 
Um, so that shows you how this very simple example works here. And you can, with it being very flexible, you can basically utilize these things as you see fit. Um, I'll quickly show you how this project is set up and how more the glue magic works. So this is a, our setup file. It's basically the like main Express server and setting up all the things that are necessary to start the Express server. So one of the bits of magic is a little tiny library we wrote called Shareify, and that's a very small module that lets you share data between the client and the server. So it can do bootstrapping of data if you have, for instance, in this case, we want to pass on the data we just fetched from the server to the client. So we say reslocals.sd, shorthand for Shareify data, dot commits equals the commits JSON. So it's passing on that JSON data to the client, so we want to refetch it on the client, as well as any configuration. So here we have an API URL, which is the GitHub API being passed to Shareify. All that stuff is available to you on the client by doing the required Shareify. Um, Data here, so you can see how SD is this shorthand namespace we're using on the server and client. Uh, going further down, like I said before, we wrote a server side backbone sync adapter. Very straightforward, use a super agent to use server side request for backbone sync so you can use backbone to fetch on the server. Um, <coughs> gives you this little helper to make sure that you're GitHub happy and passing your user agent. Um, here, should, this is just some mounting share files, some asset compilation middleware that we wrote that's for, that comes with style as some small library there as a browser file for development purposes. And finally, where we mount all of our sub -app, express applications. Um, okay. And so to testing, I think this is a good opportunity while this application is quite small to show you how testing is a lot nicer here. So in, let's see, okay, so let's start with something simple. How do model tests work? Well, it's nice, again, that we can uh, write our models in the way that we write node modules, because then we can just require it into Mocha directly. So model test is pretty straightforward. Require my model test, run Mocha on it, assert some things. Great, that tests my client side and server side model. Um, to get a little, a little bit more complex, here's a view test. And this uses a library we wrote called Bend, short for browser environment, which is just a bunch of helpers for stubbing a browser environment in Node, so you can unit test your views simply. So in this case, we have Bend set up, that's setting up JS DOM into our Node process. Bend ren render is a helper to say, here's a server side template I have, can you render it? in my JS DOM so that this view is actually based off what the server would have rendered. And passing in local and whatnot. And then finally then exposed is to if you have global libraries, not everything can be common JS wrapped. So it's exposed to helper to say we expected jQuery to be globally available. You know jQuery is common JS wrapped. Um, okay. So that's a simple easel project. Uh, diving really into nuts and bolts of that. Oh, and finally, integration testing. This is pretty straightforward if you've ever used head of headless integration like Zombie. Prior Zombie, we have an integration helper that runs our app on a port 5000 so that we can easily visit with Zombie our app and actually assert things. So we have, to an extent, full stack testing here, just that we have to stop the API. Okay. Uh, so I'll try to run faster through our large, or actually production application here.
running as Emacs, so we don't have syntax highlighting there. <laughs> um, but hopefully, we can still make sense out of this. Uh, so, okay. yeah. So again, here's that that shared by bit, but obviously a lot bigger because we have a crap ton of configuration that we're passing in. Um, here's moving forward further down. We have backbone uh, sync overwriting here, and here's where we're using our backbone cache sync library to augment our server side backbone sync to use res for caching on the server. Development middleware for asset compilation. Some more project app level express level middleware that we use specific to RC's application. And as you can see, here is where we really break up our application into lots of tiny little apps where we are requiring into our apps folder and mounting all sorts of small applications. Um, so to dive into that sub-application architecture, here's our apps folder. And apps can be big or small. Again, flexibility being a philosophy of this project. Uh, it can be as simple as our page app, which is literally like our terms and conditions page. This is rendered entirely on the server. It doesn't even use background client. Um, here's our whitelisting as URLs, our routes file. It's basically, get page, fetch it, fetch it, cache it, and render the template. And there's no client side uh, JavaScript at all. Or it can be really complex, like our fair app, which kind of looks a bit like a easel project of its own. It has components folder of its own. This thing is like this really intense half server, like half server and half client app, where we have this a lot of this stuff. If we disable JavaScript here, you'll see that a lot of it's rendered on the server, but then a lot of it is also rendered on the client, and it's just like this massive, massive thing now right in the browse portion of that now. So as we get on the server. And then Spinner is a client, and then Sable JavaScript, and a whole bunch of other stuff starts rendering on the client. And this is all sharing the same models, sometimes the same templates. And it just kind of goes on and on. <laughs> With this whole crazy background client side power event driven filter and UI. And so here we have an organization that's more appropriate for that. We have subcomponents, one for the browsing and filtering UI. We have boots, scrolling layouts. We have tons of routes here. We even have a library that does a fair specific caching fit because there's just so many API routes to pull into this thing. So we wanted to have a middleware that compiles that together and makes it easy to pass on to the rest of the routing. So that's just an example of how you can build apps in very different ways, and it's really up to you to decide what organization makes sense for app. Um, so I think last I'll dive into components to show you sort of an example of how this works. So really it's very straightforward. Um, as you can see here, this this is these are all sort of UI things. We have something like flash or uh, jump component and they can also range in complexity. So the jump component is, for example, oh, yeah, I guess it was right there. Um, on pages where you have a long scrolling thing, the jump component is just this little arrow in the bottom right. And it's used throughout the app. So we want to make it easy to pull this in wherever we need to, across apps, across pages. And it's a client, specific client side thing. So being able to, all this. Uh, these tools, these isomorphic tools and this, this uh, modular architecture makes it really simple to say require this jump view and pull in the styles from that jump component and now my page has it. And I'll show you in a second what that means about making smaller assets tailored to each page that ended up producing our JavaScript and CSS uh, package styles for the size. And again, Range of complexity, so as you had seen before, this filter UI, which is now, on, this is the armory show, like the inside the fair, we use this really intense complex filtering UI. We also use a version of it on the browse page. 
that's its own sort of more stripped down filtering UI, but they share a lot of the same functionality and rendering. So how do we say we share this? Well, we extracted it into a project by component that we can require in the individual pieces of that component necessary to build up the UI for each page. This just makes it a lot saner and a lot more modular to be able to say, I need these bits of UI, pull them into the app, specify that these things are going to make up my asset package, and now I have a lean asset package that's only pulling in what it needs, and it's really easy to reuse these different parts. Um, so, finally, how does that asset pipeline work? Uh, it's very straightforward. Again, with having stylus and browser product, if it requires, it makes it pretty easy to just have this assets directory that describes each of the asset packages we want. And as you can kind of see here, each page has its own asset package. And for instance, on the tag page, we pull in all the tags client side code for the JavaScript package. And for the stylus style sheet package, we can pull in each individual component necessary to build out that UI. And finally, the, the app itself, all the style sheets from the app. And to specify that that was our package, we just simply use a little J local here that says my asset package is a tag one. Use that, those assets. And that means that package doesn't pull in the components it doesn't use, it doesn't pull in the other apps, JavaScript or CSS it doesn't use, it just pulls in the stuff and the tailor it to, which means we can optimize the page load very nicely. And that's just like a bonus of the modular architecture. And finally, for there's like very simple nicety of having this isomorphic stuff. Uh, we use NPM for our client side and server side dependencies. And again, there are isomorphic modules on NPM, like Moment.js, a big parsing library we just require on the client or server. No problem. So it's a nice win that we don't have to even think about adopting a client side patch dependency. dependency manager. We have a built in with NPM. And anything that is not NPM, we can point to GitHub and pull in that way. So that was easel chips. Kind of like a very big nutshell. Uh, so if you're interested in diving even more, go to easeljs.com. It's easy E L. Um, you can go through all the docs and reach out your project. Okay. Uh, so I hope I have not made everyone go to sleep through that. And we're going to wrap up with some pain points and wins. Or we come moving to the
not that big of a problem lately. Like, uh, we haven't noticed it going down. Uh, but to fix it, uh, and so basically, like, even npmjs recommends this now. Uh, but if you have a deployable app, you should check in your node module. Um, it gets kind of weird in GitHub when you submit a pull request and you add a new node module and it's like 20,000 lines of change and you just like add a node module and you're like, uh, but it does allow you to always be able to pull your app and like at the end of the day, like that is code that your app is using and it's useful to be able to like to know when that has changed and if it has cost funds. So I recommend, uh, recommend doing that. Um, there's some really good blog posts about why to check in your node modules, um, but we, I guess we'll use this platform to request a GitHub ignore file, uh, where like when you submit a pull request, it would ignore the node modules changes in the viewer so that you could then like sanely review the pull request. Um, <laughs> we kind of have, have like decided to try and submit the pull request with changes, get it sort of through so it's like this is a great change, and then update the pull request with the node module change later in the um, it's odd. Uh, and we also talk about um, in, like, integration testing, uh, which is where we have a sort of third project from our API and our client app that checks out both and tests the integration between them. Because um, at the end of the day, when you're building a sort of node style app that's an API consuming app, like you're stubbing the API in all tests. And you need to make sure those assumptions remain true. Uh, and Craig is going to quickly talk about some of our ways. So, hopefully, a lot of this becomes sort of obvious over this. But uh, Community is amazing. The modular ecosystem allows this isomorphic thing to happen where introducing this idea to RT was very much, everyone was very skeptical. But it's actually, with enough uh, community support, it was quite easy to put together. Um, and again, the server and client, and the amazing package manager that we can just use server client. Um, we didn't need to really make any contributions before. That's nice. Uh, productivity has been a light years better. Uh, testing was, was a lot faster. Um, it's actually more like 1,500 tests now. Under five minutes. Uh, our deploys are a lot faster. Uh, 20 to five minutes. And we used to have to like deploy once a week because it just took so long for CI to get ready. And now the smaller projects, faster tests, just everything across the board, productivity is better. Performance, which is not necessarily focused except for page load speed, is great. Uh, so we cut our page load speed in half. We went from 40 plus rail servers that we had to scale in, uh, High traffic times, and we're just, we've been humming along the whole time on a bug free on the Roku for node servers. So we have two node servers running a production desktop website um, and mobile website. And we can optimize SEO as well, being able to render on the server. And even though we use other methods to uh, optimize that as well, besides node. But, anyways, that's all I got. So thank you. <laughs>
Uh, and uh, another question. Uh, so regarding your past uh, uh, inf infrastructure, uh, Heroku uh, yeah. is not something you can host in-house. So what do you do for local development uh, and staging, for example? Do you always just push everything uh, remotely, and you, which requires an internet connection? Or do you have an alternative, local yeah. alternative? Um, yeah, we just we use GitHub to host our source code and we pull that into a local development environment and then push that use pull request to code review and use another Heroku server to do the staging environment and we just we have a Jenkins CI machine that we use for one click deploys and we use Travis for CI on GitHub it integrates really easily. But yeah, our, our staging and production environments are just remote Heroku servers. We used to have Personal dev remote uh, systems, but for this project we didn't really need it, so it's all local. Okay, for dev. Cool. Thank you. Do you know how many cores are dedicated to your app? Sorry? How many cores will? No, 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 it's the like 2x dyno on Heroku. Um, I think it's a pretty lightweight. Um, yeah, there's like a gig of memory, and I don't know how many cores you know, it's Heroku system. Okay. <laughs> You uh, you showed the uh, the jump component, but I was curious with with some of your other components. How is composability a moment? Can you just sort of mix and match? Like, do you have a lot of design flexibility, or, or yeah? I mean, I'll show you, for instance, in the filter component. Uh, that's one of our more complex pieces. file and remove where it's required. 
How do you handle uh, namespacing within like the CSS? Oh yes, that's that was a good point. I'm glad you asked that because the, we adopted a simple pattern that um, there's a blog post by Philip Walton that's amazing. He talks about CSS architecture, but we adopt just a very simple thing. You namespace your styles by component name or app name, and that's gone far enough for us to keep our um, styles away from each other. So like in the filter component, we'll have things like filter dash sort count, pull down, or filter dash. So everything needs to be namespaced sort of by a folder directory, and that way things are nice and separated and not overlap each other. So I noticed uh, an earlier screen of CSS that was sort of nested. Now I'm wondering, are you moving from that pattern to this pattern, or are you? Well, we, yeah, so the nice thing about namespacing is you really, you don't have to nest, and it makes your, again, all leads to like smaller asset sizes because you don't have the preprocessors building out these huge duplicated styles. So you just have one declaration. So for the most part, this lets you keep things very unnested. How do you guys uh, deal with debugging when you're requiring inside of require? Uh, do you mean like circular requires? No, how do you know it's uh, the file that's doing the requiring or the actual source file that's broken? Uh, so it's all, I'll show you fast. I mean, it's basically like it's all very much um, per low level module basis. I mean, we, we test each individual component, we require the view JavaScript, we use them to help set that up. Is that answering your question? I just saw a couple modules that were requiring like another module. So uh, like, oh yes, how do we, I, I gotcha, yeah. How do we stub like our module that depends on the other modules? Mm -hmm. And to that we, we stub a lot of the external. So um, like we wrote for our it's not like comes with use a little little test helper that's like stub my child classes in case one view depends on a lot of many smaller views. Sometimes it actually just works. We don't have to stub the subclasses, but oftentimes you don't want to get into this hairy thing where you're like, here's this larger level view that, well, it's more like here's this app level view that's using all these smaller components. You test the component, you test the components, you test the app level logic stubbing out the components, and then we rely on zombie for integration testing with the mix of them all. Because you can really go down that hole if you try to like, Company every single dependency that gets pulled into your views. Um, the first slide you had the stack, which was included at Roku Reddit. Now, is this just for your read only app, or is this a fully Redis? So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, okay. So, we're not using Redis to store any sensitive data at all. If our Redis instance like died, the site would be totally fine. Um, it's really just to cache requests from this node app to our API. Uh, and just to make that jump faster. Um, our API is about like 100 to 300 milliseconds, and this is like 10 milliseconds. And so it, it just speeds up that. And then Redis allows you to do sort of like multi gets or multi sets. And so you can say, instead of fetching like five API requests, either sometimes they have, they have to be fetched synchronously, um, we would just like sort of fetch them all synchronously once and then set them all in Redis under one sort of big key, I guess. Um, and Craig showed that in the fair application. Um, when he mentioned like, using some caching nowhere, it's in here. Where do we go? Fair lib, fair data middleware. Um, so this is effectively, um, yeah. Um, it's, it's getting a ton of keys at the same time from the cache. Um, and then <laughs> it's a lot of, and that's a lot of different API requests that we would have had to fetch in parallel or synchronously. Um, so this makes the page much, much faster. Yeah, it's, it's like a loose caching layer yeah. for us where we, we use Redis for other backend projects, but they're not necessarily new projects. But one of the things related to that, are you guys just using a cache? Or are you using different providers? Oh, oh um, we've I think we're using like Redis Green now. I don't I don't remember Redis to go. There's there's like a ton of them. Um, 
Right, I think we just found the like size that we needed and like the plan that was the cheapest and most all of them. It's a on. Yeah, it's a rogue right on. Um, it was really easy to set up. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Oh, Aiden? Uh, are there any like, um, it seems like you're doing imports or things like style sheets or whatever across things like jump? Why not style sheet? Are there any, like, just component JS, yeah, so or like, product like that, and they can handle that sort of, you know, if you're importing this module, you can make sure you have these style sheets and make sure you're going to process these assets or whatever. So, component JS does a really good job at this, and uh, this is all already such a, like, new environment for the uh, dev team to work with that I want to introduce. The boilerplate for throwing JS uh, encourages, which is writing packages like throwing JSON files for basically every section of UI you want to build. It would be a matter of like writing a throwing JSON, writing these things, where we got five just like required components that come with it, a little bit of here's how you should structure your stuff. The component sort of takes this idea and forces it, and they do a good job. And they have amazing models. Like it's, we can reuse component modules with NPM and require them as well. So, uh, in your diagram, uh, you show that uh, you've broken the monolithic into a, more of a front end server, uh, node powered front, front end server, as well as uh, a Ruby API. Is it just one API or multiple APIs? Uh, yeah, right now it's just one API and it's just version one of that one API. Um, we are going to be expanding and working on an API v2 and then other APIs potentially from other apps. Uh, but what we do to manage that, it wouldn't be a big change for us. Like, so if you look at any of the, you know, like I, Okay, so like here we have like a URL declaration and we use this API URL um, variable which we, which we imported from Sharepoint, right? And that's declared in the app's configuration. So we could, in theory, have like, you know, other API URL uh, and then use that as the URL for this background collection of model. And so you use JSON, um, sorry, uh, REST, REST to communicate with the API, right? Is that the messaging? Uh, yeah, we have a, a fairly restful Ruby API, and it plugs in the background really nicely. And like Brendan said, we just have, actually, I should click on it, because it has some sensitive keys. But <laughs> giant, oh, I clicked on it. <laughs> 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 but if you saw that first corner, it's basically a giant JSON thing. And we can use Sharepoint to say, only these keys get pulled up to the client, and those can be required by the So you mentioned that it took guys like four months to get your mobile web. So what's the time for you to be like, giving you like, you know, just I guess I want to be, I guess the same as now. Um, it, oh, it's all, it also took four months. We're, we're already over, we're, we're all on the now. We're all traffic starting to over this stuff website. And it four, took four months for this. And mobile website, which is a much smaller project, is four months, it's like one and a half, two days. What is your favorite school? What is your data store? Uh, yeah, so for our data is pretty much entirely like 99% in that Ruby API that's backed by Mongo. It's Mongo for the OBM. Uh, we have other sites. As Brian said, we're decoupling more. We have other project, projects that use Postgres. Uh, this project itself uses Redis for caching. Some apps have their own data stores, but mostly Mongo. So you guys are just using like a Ruby model and you have more. So how do you guys transition to using Node? Like how is the developer like Node? Was it an expert already in Node or was it like how do you guys? Um, we're all we're all pretty uh, adapted to the background of client. Mm -hmm. And I was like the pioneer on the node front and try to keep again like I didn't want to adopt too many things that I have to and another reason I didn't want to go down like Meteor or other routes I wanted to keep it backbone things that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, so 
for the most part, it wasn't too difficult to get people to know, like, use background and server. There is a, more of a learning curve when you have to be like, that's what you do on client side, but this is a persistent server state, and you can't do that kind of thing, or like, here's how you should be doing asynchronous in the server or some client. But for the most part, the server side isn't doing insanely different stuff than like fetch some data from some background models and pass them into a template. So it was fairly painless to uh, onboard people. I'd say the most difficult part is it wasn't necessarily like building out new features, but was the testing tools and how sort of different they are and being able to like sanely debug and sort of stub your failing test. Um, you may, particularly in like an event driven app, you oftentimes need to sort of, you know, like your view that you're testing may, may like trigger an event. You need to sort of stub that and then like execute that event and then make sure that it calls the, calls the function using the result. And doing that in a testing environment is very different from what we were doing before, which was like a full integration test where you're running it in a browser, but just going to kind of do that. Like here you have to uh, force it, um, which is interesting. Uh, and it, it's like we've gotten better about it, uh, but I think that would be a great, um, an area for like future improvement in you know, those like better testing tools. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's like take the client and put it in this node process and you, when you do an integration test, you're like fire a browser and drop my state like, entirely. Whereas here we're doing testing views where the state persists between tests, you have to be more careful about doing things globally or uh, noticing, knowing how to like debug a browser environment and headlessly is definitely one of the bigger pain points of that. Yeah, I mean, overall, I'd say that like the biggest wins, like again, we are a startup and we're trying to basically be able to build like the best product we can that's like as sort of as reliable as possible. But mostly we're trying to be productive. Like we need to be able to build these features in a very competitive environment and be able to be able to build them like well and fast. And Conan's uh, structure has allowed us to be just incredibly productive. Um, and that we're just reusing previous uh, parts of the site. And so a lot of times when we're building a new feature, it's like, oh, like this other, uh, our sort of core team manages the API. It's like they have the API endpoint. We figure out which components we need. We like assemble them together, use the new API, and we're done in like half a day. It's like very, very good. Um, and that's really been the biggest win for us uh, from this architecture. And it's reliable, it's fast, it's easy to deploy and test, and very fast to test. Um, and that's been awesome. And so you're generating enough on the server side to satisfy Google SEO needs, and then it's just pagination on its own? Sort of. Um, so that's a whole thing, I'd say. Uh, we could, uh, but basically, um, we have a variety of different um, experiences that we give to people. Um, for us, the primary thing is making sure our users have a great experience. And so we built this mainly to say, say like render, give up the full content on the server, give this person that sort of like initial page incredibly quickly. Then as the sort of client app loads in, assemble the rest of the component of the site, but like they have something already. And so it's, it's a great experience there. Um, for SEO, what we do is we actually have uh, for, only for pages that require client-side rendering at all, um, we have another service. And that crawls our site uh, periodically and then stores all of like the HTML for a pre-rendered page on S3. And then we use um, the sort of escape fragment uh, meta tag. So if you look at um, like any page on RT, so I can go to this page and I can say question mark underscore escape fragment underscore equals very high. And then this, so I'm now getting what Google sees. So as you can see, um, <laughs> the cropping, the you know, it doesn't fill the width of the page as well. It's not going to load in any extra stuff because there's no JavaScript. 
Um, but effectively, this is an entirely pre-rendered page. And so how you do this is, uh, Google has some good docs on it. Um, uh, but basically, you have this meta name brand. It's total gibberish, basically. Um, but that's why, that's, that's Google. Um, so yeah, you add that to your page, and then Google will crawl it with this meta tag. And, and with our sort of existing um, Nginx routing that we talked about earlier, we basically scan for this param. And if it has that param, we direct to the S3 button. Certainly, you could uh, go, to the top, go to distance and render everything on the server if you wanted to. But since we were already building this thing out in parallel at the time, it wasn't really easy case to solve. Although, this is something that I uh, feel that render is good at giving you a convention for rendering an entire page full in the server and rendering that full page from the client as well. There's some response to that. You know, the Google uh, renders JavaScript now, so why not? That is a good question. You're playing with all the voodoo with Google's magic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we haven't seen it yet on our site. Um, so it's like, it's a very, um, it's an experimental thing. So for example, there's like levels here. So it may execute JavaScript, but it may not place exter external HTTP requests, which it would have to do in our case. So I, I would imagine if I was building a crawler, that would be a very difficult thing, right? Like, Executing JavaScript is one thing, but like crawling the entire internet and then letting, then placing all of the entire internet's like external HTTP requests that they place, like say for all their ads, for all their like other stuff, like that's a lot of burden on a web crawler. And I would imagine that's not something that's actually going to come soon from Google. Uh, and so since our app depends so much on placing external HTTP requests to render, um, we built this and we think it's a good like, longer term thing that's reliable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that it? Is it? <laughs> okay, well, thank cool. you very much.